Well, I, you know, I try to um, give people at least a kind of overview of the historic background. I'm not a historian, but it's important to know a bit about it. Um, what would I say about it? I mean, Ireland has a very keen sense, I suppose, as a society has long done of its, uh, its victimhood and its oppression by, uh, by England. Um, and um, involved in that has been the construction of an identity as non-British, some way of maintaining a sense of oneself as different and separate culturally. Um, you know, during the 19th century, Irish as a language was starting to die off. Um, people needed some way, I suppose, of differentiating themselves. And Catholicism, religion, became the main way to do that. And a lot of this was also driven by British prejudice against not just Irish people, but by Catholicism as well. You know, um, you sort of take the, the negative stereotypes being used against you and turn them into assets or, or elements to be defended. Um, and also during the course of the 19th century, specifically after the famine in Ireland, um, there was a change in the nature of the Catholic Church. Um, previously, it had been kind of disorganized, poorly staffed. Irish Catholicism was almost a kind of a folk religion. You know, it was not very orthodox. Um, there weren't very high rates of mass attendance and um, priests were badly trained, frequently drunken, and uh, didn't have a great deal of control over what people thought and did. Um, well, I mean, it varied in different places in the country. But then in the middle of the 19th century, um, under a guy called Paul Cullen, Ireland's first archbishop, there was a real drive to reform the church and impose orthodox discipline on the people and make them, in, in essence, exemplary Catholics. And um, so the church's manpower increased greatly. Its, its, um, its infrastructure increased greatly. Um, also, by this time, um, there was no longer a kind of British effort to suppress Catholicism. They kind of realized, well, the Irish are never going to become Protestants in, in large numbers. Um, so we may as well uh, let them have their religion. And perhaps it can even be a kind of um, a force for ensuring kind of social order and compliance in a certain degree, you know. Um, so Irish people became very Orthodox Catholic. There became a kind of proliferation of, of people doing kind of Roman rituals and and uh, being concerned with being good, moral, devout Catholics and sexual chastity and all the rest of it. And some of this change can be linked to to the changes in society that took place as a result of the famine. You know, a lot of people died, and a lot of people emigrated. And um, what remained and the people that went on to staff the church were this kind of emerging Catholic middle class that were very concerned with respectability. And then in the early 20th century, you know, after 1916, after later, after independence, the, the country kind of emerged as this very poor place, um, which relied on the church to provide social, certain social services, health care, education, um, and which was infused with this Catholic nationalism. You know, I mean, what, what is there about Ireland that's enviable? Really, in Europe, it was like this backwater, this impoverished um, former colony um, with little to its name, uh, right beside, you know, England, uh, the old enemy, which was so powerful and successful. And how could we distinguish ourselves? Well, by, um, by being the best Catholics in the world, by being the purest and most unimpeachable um, Catholics. So you had this really, really Catholic society developing after independence, um, where this kind of the, the idea of being an Irish person and being a Catholic were almost, almost one and the same thing. And people often ask, you know, did that make Ireland a theocracy? Um, and it wasn't straightforwardly a theocracy. And part of the reason, I suppose, is that um, the church had such control through the education system and through people's sense of identity as Irish equals Catholic, that there was no need really for priests to dictate to politicians how to run the country. 
the politicians already intuitively obeyed them because they've been raised in this hyper-Catholic system. And um, so that persisted for mu much of the 20th century. Um, and it started to break apart gradually from the late 1960s onwards. The reason basically being that a new generation of politicians took over that were somewhat less formed by the, that Catholic nationalism and somewhat more global in their outlook. And what they wanted was to produce the conditions for economic transformation in the country, really. So the education system was somewhat overhauled. And this new economic model developed that was all about getting in foreign money into the country, uh, foreign direct investment, we call it. Ireland, I suppose the, the roots were sowed for Ireland's later role in the 1990s as a kind of and um, 2000s as a tax haven for American corporations. So after that point in time, you see this kind of shift where, where um, people get richer, you know, at first gradually and then from the 90s pretty quickly. And um, they still, you know, feel they still, as they always say, you know, oh, I was born Catholic. Well, you can't be born Catholic. You know, you're supposed to get baptized Catholic. It's not an ethnic identity, we're told, but in Ireland it pretty much is. But what you have, have happening over this period of time is the church is receding in importance as a kind of religion in people's lives. And Catholicism is, is staying there, but just kind of as almost a habitual ethnic identity that you just are but you don't really think about it all that much except when a census comes through your letterbox or something like that then you remember to tick that correct box or when you're in school you know you say the right things or participate in various rites of passage because that's what you do so this kind of more habitual version develops from let's say the 70s 80s onwards and that kind of loosens the connection um, but then, then, and I suppose maybe we'll get into this later, then you also have, from the 90s onwards, um, all these kind of revelations about the Catholic past, about these unsavory aspects of that extremely deferent Catholic culture, um, various scandals, um, the abuse of children being one, but not the only one. Um, so you get this backlash against that Catholic identity. Um, and that's where we are today. We're, we're somewhere quite far along in that process now. Um, yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot of recent history to get into that I haven't got into there because I just, I suppose it's too recent perhaps to be considered the kind of historical background you're talking about. I don't know. When does history end and the present begin? It's, uh, I don't know. <laughs> well, te technically your last sentence is also part of history. So, wow. Yeah. That's uh, mind blown. <laughs> But um, for 